Hey, welcome to episode two of Worth 1,000 Words, where I attempt to write a thousand word short story based on a piece of artwork. If you're new here, my name is Jason, I'm a fiction writer, and if you're interested in anything storytelling related, whether that be writing craft, movie reviews, game reviews, book reviews, you should subscribe, check it out. Anyway, let's move on with today's piece of artwork. Today's artwork is entitled Mystery, and it's by a concept artist named David Jones out of the UK. So why did I pick this one? Well, I'm a bit of a sucker for horror western, and as you can see, there is a horror element here. We got these bones hanging around from, from eaves and these derelict buildings, and you know, it's kind of a ghost town, but something happened here, or is happening. Clearly, there's no one walking around, but... You know, are they hiding in the shadows? Are they, are they, you know, just about to jump out? Is this the beginning? Are they, is there an attack about to happen? Or is it just a ghost town and there's nobody here and this is the aftermath and this is sort of the carcass of the town left behind? I don't know. But this guy looks like he probably just arrived and is investigating something. I don't know. I just dug it. Thanks, David. Awesome artwork. Let's get on to the writing. All right, I made a little adjustment to the size i know it was i got some feedback saying it was a little difficult to read on mobile i didn't think of that so thank you for the suggestion hopefully this is a little bit more legible i haven't watched it on my phone yet obviously but let's see how it goes so yeah the the first thing i noticed not the first thing i noticed I should say but i was thinking about going from foreground to middle ground um with those those bone chimes off to the side there and i like <laughs> i like how i wrote tooths that, that's that's quite interesting to note there. So don't feel bad if you have terrible grammar while you're just trying to crank stuff out. You can see here that I'm sticking with the teeth. I imagine them to be wind chimes. I, I don't know if they are, but they're probably, um, you know, some kind of ornamental warning sign, I guess. I'm going back in time. You'll notice I do that from time to time. I think books do that a lot, obviously, where, all right, he's in this moment in time. Maybe he just got to the town. Maybe he's been standing there for a long time surveying the area, but this just came to my head. Well, how did he get here? And so I decided there's a crone in some nearby town that, that gave this guy a tip to check it out. And then I'm equating that to, or comparing that to how, how drained he is from his journey. And then we introduced the crow who is hanging out in the upper right hand corner of the screen upper right hand corner of the screen our protagonist addresses him kind of a frustration you know because he knows he needs to go investigate but maybe he's a little bit of fear in him i don't know and thank you for the artist for giving me a name for this building the pueblo pine company so that was helpful and i think you know one of the tenets of writing is you know be as specific as you can rather than general it just adds a lot more color uh, makes things feel more realistic, so that's why I did that. And then we are taken to the chapel, where I'm using the, the head of the bull down there as kind of a centerpiece, which which it is, that's uh, pulling him closer. And I decide here that um, despite he was never, the fact that he was never uh, a man of God, he he, uh, he didn't like the, the look of it. And then there I noticed the, the, the weird tarp or skin or something. You know, why is the roof gone? I don't know. Oh, and then here... <laughs> This just popped up in my head. I thought like this crow or this raven was just constantly just getting in his head. And then I, I decided to actually create a word out of out of his, his sound. And that's where I got coward from. Now is that now is that really happening? Probably not. I think it's just inside of his head, uh, getting him to to push on. So um, he's he's contemplating shooting the the raven at this point, but he doesn't want to give him the satisfaction. He knows he needs to definitely be the one moving forward. I don't know. Is this guy is this guy like a gunslinger? Is he investigate an investigator? Why is he here? Did he do this? That would have been an interesting twist. I'm just now thinking of that, but that is not how it ends up. I'm adding some sounds here because I wanted to make sure he wasn't looking at him. Like you know, you have this kind of this this needling sound at, at the side of you just kind of uh pushing so here i i mentioned he's low on bullets or rounds i should say um but he's not a good shot i've established he's maybe he's not a gunslinger after all and here the the shadow of the building is uh where he wants to stay it's kind of almost a protective shield and and i use the opportunity to have him go investigate the the bones hanging from the from the eaves there so a little bit maybe he's trying to get a lay of the land a little bit more maybe he's using this as a tool to to not move forward right he's, he's just 
using this as an excuse to procrastinate what he needs to do. Then I'm uh, pushing back out into the distance, middle ground, where he's noting the rest of the, the, the ravens on the rooftops. Once again, he's not sure what he's going to do. And he's back to the raven, his, his friend over closest to him, who is taunting him. And then I add, you know, maybe he's got a little bit more intelligence. He's more than a bird. Uh, at least that's how he's, how he's viewing it. He's not a simple beast. And he decides to draw his weapon on this raven. But he knows he doesn't have a lot of rounds. Half-empty cylinders stared back at him. So that's a more powerful image uh, to remind him that he he only has a few rounds left. And who the hell knows what's going on in this chapel down there with a with a skull stake to it. And then, you know, he's he's making his way here, uh, making his way down the path toward the chapel. And it's taking him back once again. It's, it's bringing a memory. This is an opportunity to, to have a little character. So we learn that he uh, maybe drinks too much. He's in this guy's Jeb saloon too often where he goes back and forth from the bar to the back seat. And then what, what saloon or what, uh, what Old West establishment isn't uh, without a whorehouse? I threw that in there. And what I did is I, I used it as a device here. You can see that there's this creaking step on the, uh, on the, on the staircase that leads to the, to the balcony where these women are. And I marked that with a midpoint, meaning you know, he's climbing these steps it's too far to go back. Might be ashamed. I don't know. Maybe everyone's seen him. He, he's got he's to go to the top. And what I did is I, I used this as a point to bring him back. Now we're established that he's, or that now that we're establishing he's midway along the path, uh, he, he's, it's too far to go back. So he continues. And he, you know, looks behind him. The Pueblo Pine Company building looked mighty refreshing. If, if that wasn't enough, the sun itself seems to be causing him problems. It spears him to the spot, then it propels him forward like a battering ram. And now he's looking at the eyes of the skull ahead here, you know, kind of describing how something that as mundane as a, as a bull or a cow can have like a horror to it, be, be creepy, you know, in different circumstances. And once again, uh, there's another element where he decides, uh, you know, I need to go in. The brothers of the crows are going to shit on me or, or mock me if I don't keep going forward. So... He does. And then inside we find this, I noticed the roof had a lot of holes in it, this tarp or this cloth, cloth or skin, whatever it is. So I figured, you know, uh, lights, light would be lancing through it and use that as kind of a, 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 a means to create this, I say, otherworldly geometry. I guess that's a little bit of Lovecraft in there. And then he sees the pews, all these dead people lined up. And finally we're introduced to someone who's alive, some guy worshiping something a bag of flesh apparently and i just had the bracketed names in here because i i figured i should name this character at some point calling him he might be a little too confusing especially because i've created two two characters at this point here we're seeing our protagonist notice something interesting about the character that is in fact his hands are skinless so he sees the tendons the the bone the blood and he has a <laughs> All hail moment. He's doing the best he can. He, he's not, I think we've established that he's not a, uh, a gunslinger. He's not a man of the law. <laughs> so he's, he's trying to just uh, diffuse the situation or what situation might come up next. And here we see the man struggling to, to rise to his full height. Something's wrong. Well, he's got no skin on his hand, so it's probably something to do with that. I don't know if that was to myself. <laughs> now what or not continue a little dialogue and then uh, the man is is not really addressing his question at all he's saying some kind of cryptic things and here i was just i don't know i threw a reference into drunk priests for some reason i believe i take that out later and i'm approaching a thousand words already I'm, I think at this point I was a little worried. I was like, I'm going to go over. I'm not done yet. I don't know how this is going to end. And you'll see that this session took me quite a bit longer. There was significantly more editing in this one than, um, than episode one. And Harry's uh, considering killing this guy. And in fact, the man is stripped of flesh. And I thought it'd be cool here. To, you know, he shows him shows that he's a little educated. He's He's seen... Some things from surgeons, artisans. I, I was kind of referencing the illustrations of human anatomy that 
anatomy there, but seeing it in the flesh, so to speak, is nothing like he could imagine. And I've passed 1,000 words, still trying to wrap it up at this point. And then the robed man, or once robed man, fell before uttering his final words. And I, I kept the dialogue very reactionary. I don't even know if you need it, really, but I felt like it. It was a little more realistic than just having full, fully descriptive text. I just imagine myself in that in that situation, and as you know, you you kind of utter things as as a physical reaction or to accompany a physical reaction. And here, once again, he's he's thinking about making sure this guy's dead, and he's you know waiting. These these flies start to land on his body immediately, but there's no there's no stirring. And he waits. I decided to make him wait. He just wanted to. It, it's kind of funny because it, it's, it's a fear as well, right? Oh, and then I'm going back up to the top. Editing editing time now. You can see I've fixed tooths. <laughs> and really what I'm trying to do is I'm at 11.20. So I'm really trying to remove as many words as possible to get it down to a 1000 and I, I tend to like go down lower, I go up a bit above and just kind of whittle it away. Just changing some more words, sentences here, truncating things. I think really this is a really good exercise and I say this later, I'm sure I can tell the future where um, it, it forced me to really think about my word choices, what sentences were necessary, what weren't. And I even think after all this is done, there will be probably a lot of un unnecessary words. Just continuing to clean it up. I'm still at a thousand fifty-seven, fifty-eight. Added some words. Down again. So it's you'll see it's this back and forth action of up and down, up and down. Misspellings here and there. Simplifying still. And I think that this was this was pretty fun. I saw the clock and I, and I said, "Oh man, I'm I'm already." What am I almost eight minutes past last completion? How long is this gonna end? How long is this gonna go? When it went when will it end? Luckily I didn't go too far. I mean I guess I almost went an hour and a half. Here I'm trying to find the correct terminology. I still I felt like it was on the tip of my tongue. I just couldn't get it out and I don't even believe that that intelligence comment is, is really what I was going for anyway. So now that I'm down, I'm down to nine ninety three. So just reading it and then saying, Okay, where can I add some back? And I'm not even halfway through the document. I got to be careful because I'm going to quickly go over a thousand words most likely. And this was a, a fun, stressful game of uh, fighting a clock, fighting a word count, and trying to make a halfway coherent story. One thing, too, I, I tried to do, and I don't know how successful I was, but it's, it's important to always try to describe things in the voice of the character. And, you know, this is Old West. I tried to have some little bit of dialect in there. I don't know if I succeeded or not. I did my best. I tried to hear his voice in my head. It's funny though because he he kind of looks he looks clean, right? He doesn't look like this weathered gunslinger or wanderer. He almost looks like an accountant, like a western accountant or something. No offense, hey Dave on the art if if you're listening. I I, I love this whole thing. And I I will I will admit that I did read his entry at Art Station. Uh, it mentioned a description about this character investigating certain situations. So that could be why he's a little bit more clean looking and less like a traditional Old West guy that might show up in a, a ghost town full of bones and missing people. Well, I guess that's what a ghost town is. Yeah, it's just still cleaning up. Oh, we. I go back and forth here like... What's more powerful is is we we are clean or I am clean like what is is it, is it important to address the the group as a total oh and I, as a total oh and I named him Anton as I was writing this I kept trying to think of what's a cool Western sounding name and I, I believe I completely failed but I do think that Anton speaks more to the way he looks in the artwork than maybe he uh, he acted in my head so maybe or maybe I'm just giving my credit myself credit for um, for no reason. Here I am sitting at 999 words. Oh, down to 997 now. You'll see here too that I I play with the ending. I wasn't sure. It's, what really struck me is the the Chekhov's gun, I believe. Sorry if I'm, I'm butchering that, but 
You know, when you show a gun on the mantle, it's something or other that it has to go off by the third act. So I thought his damn gun has to go off. Uh, and in hindsight, I think maybe it would have been better to kill the Raven, a Raven, maybe not the same Raven on the old uh, Pueblo Pine Company building, but that could have brought it back full circle, I think, rather than it being a coyote. But I, I wanted something... I don't know, something to signify that, that the uh, the scavengers were coming. I thought about ending it with a with a single line. I start adding lines of gun smoke here and then quickly just sent, wow, it's gonna get me too far. I, I guess what I should have done too is, is gone a little higher. I should have maybe ended the last sentence or paragraph with something I was really happy about because we really wanna, you wanna leave the reader with that sense of closure, maybe not closure, catharsis, something like that leave it somewhat open-ended. And I, I think I did definitely do that, but I could have, yeah, here we go, trying the, uh, trying to add some dialogue again. I'm like, nope, oh, man, that's knocking me up 10 words. And I, I thought I would end it, you saw it at the beautiful outside. So he's yearning to, he, he's in this hellish place, right? There's all these dead bodies everywhere. There's a, a skinned man at his feet that was worshiping himself, his, his own flesh, or using it as some kind of offering and then worshiping. So he, he's looking outside, seeing the sun rays. I, I, I think I, yeah, I think I started making it evening and then I decided, no, let's keep it daytime still. Not a lot of times passed and that would be a nice counterpoint. And that's it. So this is where I ended it. 999. I know I had one more word in there. I don't know why it ended right there. What happened? I swear it's in there. Oh man, this is so embarrassing. Let's see, wait, oh, there we go, thousand. I just missed it, sorry, there it is. This one was tough. I felt like when I was originally creating all the words, it was just kind of a mess. I had some scattered ideas. I didn't feel like it was very linear. I didn't know where I was going, but I got somewhere. And, and what I told myself consciously to do is, I don't wanna just have this guy contemplating what he's going to do the whole time, meaning capturing exactly what I see in this image. But use this image as a starting point of sorts. A, this is where it begins, and then I want to take the story a little further. I want to use this as, let's say, the inciting incident, opening scene, act one, whatever you want to call it, and then see what the hell's inside that chapel. That's what I did. And I think you'll see a lot of that in the coming stories where I will take the image and use it as maybe a midpoint instead of a, an ending or a beginning and vice versa, or maybe somewhere in between. But I think though that it is important to, to use these images to signify crucial points in the story because that's what you're looking at. Uh, that's what was captured. The bones rang hollow, hanging from eaves like teeth they did, like the teeth of that crone who led Anton here. A gust kicked up his dust before tickling those teeth into song once more. However, it didn't have the energy to keep it up, just like him. The story that Crone and nearby Clanston told proved to be more than a tall tale. And although a half day's ride to get here, he was drained. As drained as these bones of marrow, not a tool mark nor tooth mark to whisper their demise. Call! I'm thinking, God damn it," he said without looking up to the raven perched on the carcass of Pueblo Pine Company. The chapel called to him louder, though, with eyes, not voice, eyes blacker than the raven's, with a roof stripped of most of its shingles, replaced by a hide of another kind. Call. The finger hooked around his revolver's trigger itched. The raven's talons clacked, urging him to look, or not to. A single round left, and he was never much of a good shot anyway. Staying in the shadow of the building, he inspected the bone chimes further. Tied loose enough to clatter in the wind, leather cords spiraled around them before going back up through their bored, clean centers. More ravens lined up on distant rooftops, as curious as to his next move as the one a dozen feet away from him. Hell, as curious as he was. That son of a bitch cocked its head to the side like all birds do before resuming a posture of uncanny intelligence, black marble eyes reflecting a blacker sky. Coward! He set his jaw with clenched teeth, and he found he had drawn his weapon, scuffed barrel aimed between those damned devil eyes. The mostly empty cylinder stared back at him, harder than the eyes of the raven, 
and with a long exhale, he holstered it back. You win, he said and spit into the scrub. The path was too smooth, smoother than old Jeb's saloon floor he had paced far too many times from bar to rear table, always shadowed. He suddenly missed that floor, with a loose, creaking board up to the second level where ladies waited to satisfy any man with enough cash to buy a few drinks. That creak was music to their ears, the balcony empty until you set foot on that step just one past mid-flight, too far to go back. One step past halfway he was when he turned. The shadow of the Peblo Pine Company building looked mighty refreshing, even with that damn curse of an animal still up there watching him. The clouds decided to let the sun spear him to this spot for some reason, the surrounding sky clogged with gray. That spear turned into a battering ram and he was propelled forward by a force not his own. Those eyes a darkness he hadn't thought possible. He knew what it looked like in life, lazily walking the pasture, chewing, always chewing. Now it had a horror to it, mounted to the door, impossible to blink, taking him all in with that deep blackness. He knew the brothers of the raven were above looking down at him, and he decided to step inside before they shit or made further mockery of his cowardice. Beams of light looked to be the bulk of the load-bearing architecture inside, crisscrossing each other with some otherworldly geometry. Pews were stocked with the dead, stripped as clean as their bovine companions outside, upright, all of them. Faces forward, attentive, entranced, by. A man on his hands and knees, then just knees, rising and lowering himself in some perverse, Worship. What he worshipped looked to be the only thing containing moisture Anton had seen since he drained the last of his canteen. A bag of flesh, strung up, pinned, not unlike the flesh that provided this chapel with a shelter from the elements. Then he noticed the hands. Took the man three prayers before he did. Glistening red, tendons linking bone, so damn white. Shit. He breathed and unholstered his weapon. You there. Hands of whatever it is you're praying to, and I hope it's up. Either way, just make sure I can see him. The man kept his hands raised as instructed, remained erect on knees a moment before standing to his full height. It was a struggle for him, and his stance wasn't much more than the death slouch of a man ready to expire. Now, tell me what's going on here. Who else you with? He wasn't much for interrogation or shooting. He really needed a partner. It is clean, the robe man finally said. We are clean. The words were slurred, each statement closing with a click of teeth. The robe man turned. I am clean. Anton almost loosed the last round by what he saw. He didn't even stop the man from lowering his hands which set his rope to slip off his body, his skinless body. Anton had known enough surgeons and artisans over his career to have seen what was displayed before him now. But no matter the skill of the artist or the detail of the illustration, nothing came close to this. Living flesh, pulsing, dripping with what we all know runs beneath us in rivers and torrents, sometimes in trickles, but never truly comprehend. The once-robed man opened his mouth, but the words never left. He collapsed with the sound of wet meat. Jesus, Anton said. Anton knew he wasn't listening, even if he believed. Not in a place like this. Not ever. He held his gun there, considering letting his final round punch through the skull of what this man had become. One fly landed, then a second, then a third. Not a flinch from the pile, not a whimper. The sound to his left and Anton spun, pulling the trigger. The coyote yelped and then darted into the beautiful outside. What did I learn? What are my final thoughts? I think you can see clearly I was struggling with this a bit more. First of all, I went a good 30 minutes longer than episode one. So episode one, the writing session was about 51 minutes. 
This one was about an hour and 20. Sometimes it's going to take longer. Sometimes it's going to take less time. That's that's just part of it. You never know what you're going to get into. I think the one thing you could take out of this is the thousand word constraint. Now that does seem arbitrary, like I said before, but what did that do? It forced me to have an economy of words, be as succinct as possible, analyze every sentence, analyze every word within reason, I didn't want to spend hours upon hours on this and edit and edit over and over and over again. But you could see that I definitely went through this a lot more than I did episode one. I could feel myself being tested a little bit like, you know, in there. And it was it was trying to a degree. But uh, I hope you got something out of it. Thanks for watching. And as always, if you guys have any suggestions for the channel, if you have a piece of cool artwork and you want to send me to write a story to you, that'd be awesome. I made two. <laughs> I've gotten through two. That means this wasn't a one-off deal. So subscribe, like the video. Hope you stick around for more because there will be more. I'm shooting for one a week. So keep an eye out. Probably Wednesday is what I'm thinking. There's also going to be some more content. I have an idea. I just finished The Last of Us 2. Been waiting to do that so I could talk about it. I know it's been done to death on the internet, but I have a few things to say that aren't as angry and negative. So it'll be interesting. Anyway, uh, thanks again, and I will see you in the next one. Bye. If you'd like to read this story in its non-video format, check the link in the description. I didn't add anything else, promise. Thanks again.